good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here. We're going to get started. The Bible says in Matthew 28, it says, But the angel said unto them, Do not be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. But he is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and sing about our risen Savior. He lives within our heart. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always here. He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along. There's a lot going on today, and all of it's good. We're going to direct our attention to the baptistry at this time. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here this morning. Uh, in my ministry, I have had the distinct uh, opportunity and blessing to baptize families. And this morning, I get to baptize three sisters. Praise the Lord. So we're excited about this. Uh, this is Edith Kraut. She is, well, these three girls are the youngest three daughters of Philip and Sandy Crowd, who came a, a month or so ago and joined our church. But this morning, we're going to start with Edith. Edith, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning on this Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Father, we will honor you with baptizing Edith, Rory, and Eliza. And Father, we pray for Edith that you would bless her, that you would bring her up, raise her up to be a strong Christian woman, to be a light to a dark world, and to be an example to those that she's around. We pray that she would be a blessing to this church, that we would be a blessing to her. And we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, what you know? Edith, on your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Yeah. All right, come on, Rory. One of the girls said, I feel like I'm in my pajamas. I said, well, <laughs> we're barefooted and running around in church. It's kind of weird. But anyway, Rory, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Amen. Father God in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for Rory and for her testimony of faith. I thank you that this morning we are baptizing uh, all three of these sisters, Father, not to be saved. They've already done that. They put their faith and trust in you as their Savior. But this morning we're baptizing them because they are saved. And they are proclaiming to the world that they love you and that they want to follow Jesus throughout their life. So, Father, we pray for Rory this morning. We pray that you would bless her and that you would bring her up. Strengthen her as she grows in her faith to honor you, to love you, to serve you. We thank you for this dear family. We pray that you would bless them, that we would be a blessing to them, that they would be a blessing to us here at Victory. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. Don't hold your nose yet. I'm going to say something else. Rory, on behalf of your testimony of faith, by the authority of Victory Missionary Baptist Church, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's warm, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Last but not least, we have the youngest. This is Eliza. Eliza, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. Amen. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, I thank you for Eliza and for her testimony. I thank you so much for this great opportunity um, 
to be here this morning, Father, to recognize you, to celebrate Jesus Christ and his resurrection, Father, and to celebrate that through the baptism of these three sisters. Father, we thank you for this family. We thank you for their faith. We thank you for bringing them to victory to serve alongside us. And God, we pray that you just bless Eliza and that you strengthen her to be a, a strong follower of you as she grows in her faith. Lord, we thank you for her testimony of faith. We thank you for the opportunity to baptize her this morning and that she's telling the world today that she loves you and that she wants to follow you. We thank you most of all for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Eliza, on behalf of your testimony of faith, I baptize you by the authority of Victory Missionary Baptist Church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a great day to start our Easter celebration today. I was, I was just reminded as our children are coming up, you know, this isn't a memorial service today. This is a celebration of life today. Celebration of our Savior Jesus Christ who is alive and well today seated at the right hand of the Father. Welcome. We're glad that every one of you are here in the services today. We want to take just a moment, if you would, to join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the assurance that Jesus is alive. Father, I pray that your will be done in this service, that you will move freely, that you will draw all men to you, that at the end of this service today, Everyone present will know that they have been in your presence, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Miss Malia.
Amen. All right. Let's give him one more hand. I'll tell you what, we're going to have to work hard to top that. We're, we're going to try. Let's stand and let's sing. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say. Once again, and let's uh, listen to the choir as we sing. Shout, hey, Hosanna. Christian. Today is an offering day. I didn't, I didn't tell. Glory and light, all praises to the only. 
All right, it's your turn to sing with us. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring on failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross, Jesus is waiting there with open arms, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. sing together hymn number 348 from our hymnal my savior's love i stand amazed in the presence of jesus the song. 
one more to sing this morning. Uh, listen as they sing. This is our God.
All right, we're going to sing one more. It's time. Let's stand and let's sing what he's done. Oh, see, on a hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me, my Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give us life, grace flowing from His side, no greater sacrifice for what He's done. All glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. See for the freedom. is heaven oh I praise God for what he's
What a wonderful job the children did this morning. Amen. What a wonderful job the choir did this morning. It's just a blessing to be here. And now I want to invite your attention to the book of Acts chapter 3. We continue our study uh, of this book of Acts. And um, <clears throat> this morning, uh, it's not that we're not going to focus on the resurrection of Jesus. We are going to, in fact, focus on the resurrection of Jesus. Sometimes I'm amazed in these studies how they just happen to fall at just the right time. But they don't just happen to do anything. God's in control. And I love it uh, when, I, when I see he's in control and not myself. Would you stand with me as you read from the, God's Word? title of the message today is Jesus. There's one thing I want you to know today. It's just Jesus, okay? And uh, to give you rundown. Right? You need to stand for a moment, don't you? Well, you're going to stand for a moment, whether you need to or not. I'm going to give you a little background before I start reading, okay? Uh, Peter and John, in the verses just prior to this, been on their way to the temple where they encountered a lame man. This lame man was laid at the gate of the temple every day for all of his life. He had never walked. He had never entered the temple. All he did was beg. And so Peter and John, going into the temple, experienced these, or, or ran into this man, if you will, and this man asked for money from them, because that's what he did for a living. Peter told him, silver and gold I do not have, but that which I have I give you. In the name of Jesus, and I love that part, we preached that last week. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And you know what that guy did? He laid there. No, he didn't. He got up. He didn't just get up. It says he leaped and jumped, walked, praised God. And, and everybody sees him jumping and leaping. And he goes into the temple for the first time. And, and everybody, as I said, the crowd of people who have seen him laid at the, at the gate of the temple every day his entire life now see. They know this is the guy that has never walked. This is where we pick up reading verse 11. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter... And John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly wondered or greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness, we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and kill the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we, we come to you with thanksgiving and rejoicing. Thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the sacrifice in payment for our sins. Thank you that he rose from the grave. Today is seated at the right hand of the Father, your right hand, Heavenly Father, to make intercession for the saints. Today we celebrate the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we pray, Lord, that you'll speak to all through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now today, at this point, after reading 
the question that's going to be on everyone's mind, everyone here, that, that we read about is, is Jesus really alive? And, and Peter's going to answer that question that's in their mind, right? And he begins with the statement of, why are you greatly amazed? In verse 12, he said, why, are you, why do you marvel? Why does this surprise you? You see, the first thought, uh, of course, would be he's a lame man. Now he's walking. Anybody would be surprised. But Peter's point is this. This is so Jesus. Okay? If you know Jesus, you would know that he had fed 5,000 with two fish and five loaves, right? If you knew Jesus, you would know that it's Jesus who had give sight to the blind, heal the lame before, heal the sick. It's Jesus that had called Lazarus out of the grave, and Peter was there, and he saw all this, and no doubt the people here had heard the stories. So Peter's saying, what's the big deal? Jesus is being Jesus. It's not a big deal for this lame man to walk. But Peter makes it very clear that it is not by his power, okay? Peter wasn't a TV evangelist that uh, got on TV, said, send me $10,000 and I'll send you back a prayer cloth that'll heal you. Peter, from the very beginning, confesses and wants everybody to know that it is by the name of Jesus that this man has been healed. No power of Peter or, or no power of John. It was simply Jesus. But here's the question. Jesus has been crucified. This crowd would have seen him hang on the cross. This crowd, many in this crowd, were likely there when they stuck the spear in the side of Jesus and blood and water poured out. Many would have been there as they hauled Jesus away to bury him and put him in the grave. So when Peter says, hey, this is Jesus, they're going to go, huh? What do you mean, this is Jesus? And... Um, the answer is in verse 16, where it says, And his name, the name of Jesus, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Jesus has healed this man, Peter saying, and he's healed this man through faith. Now, I want you to understand that the faith that it's speaking of here is not the lame man's faith. Those who talk about if you've got enough faith, you'll be healed. You don't know what you're talking about. That's not biblical, okay? You know whose faith uh, resulted in this lame man being healed? It was Peter and John's faith. Peter and John had the faith to, to uh, uh, share Jesus and, and say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. It was Peter and John that was exercising that faith, and it was that faith in Jesus that gave this man his legs back. But the wonderful thing about this, Peter's pointing all credit to Jesus, but we also know that at this point forward, Jesus is working through the lives of his followers. Isn't that awesome? You understand that today. When we say Jesus is alive, you're probably not going to see Jesus today. I guess unless you die and go to heaven, right? How are you going to see Jesus? You're going to see Jesus through the lives of his followers. Those who, who place their faith and their trust in Jesus. And do you understand the power that's available to us? I'm not talking about, I'm not saying you've got the power to tell somebody that's lame, rise, get up and walk. But I will tell you this, if Jesus is truly living in you, you have the power to change the lives of those around you. Just by living Jesus. Sharing the love of Jesus. Sharing the joys of Jesus. If there's one thing this world needs to see, it's love and joy. I mean, just look at our elections. There's no love, nor is there any joy, right? I want you to understand, it's our faith that matters in the lives of other people. Just as Peter and John's faith mattered in the lives of this lame man. And what was the point? 
to Peter and John's faith. It was to reveal Jesus. To show them who Jesus really was. And the first thing he tells them in, in, in Acts, 13, or Acts 3, 13, he says, Jesus, first of all, you need to know who Jesus is. Jesus came to serve. Now, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Understand how Jesus came to serve. He didn't come to give everybody exactly what they wanted. Sometimes it aggravates me that we treat, Santa, uh, we treat Jesus like Santa Claus. That's not who he is, you know. Jesus came to serve, to fill a need. What was the need? To pay for your sin debt and my sin debt. You know one thing that's common in here today is that every one of you and my oh no, this means, every one of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? None of us can look around and say, "Well, I'm better than they are." Why? Because we've all sinned. And the wonderful thing is is that Jesus came to serve us by paying for our sin debt on the cross of Calvary. But the problem with, with Jesus in that day being the servant, they didn't want a serving Savior. They wanted a king that would come and deliver them from Roman occupation. So what did, what did they do? Uh, Peter said they delivered him up or they betrayed him. They handed him over to the authorities. They disowned him. When it says they denied him, it literally means to disown Jesus. They said, Jesus, we don't want you as a servant. We want a king to do what we want. Not only was Jesus a servant, but Jesus was God in the flesh. In verse 14 it says, But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. That word holy, it means consecrated, or one who is anointed or appointed to the service of the Lord. Do you realize Jesus was handpicked by God? God chose Jesus for the mission of dying for the sin of the world. For your sin and for my sin. And Jesus, being the appointed by God, he was just, which means he conformed to the character of God. You understand, when Jesus said in John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. As he walked this earth, he was God in the flesh. He came to show people what God looked like, but the people of that day did not want to know what God looked like. They didn't want a just, a holy Messiah, so they chose to choose a murderer when they were given the option, and Pilate said, who will you have me to deliver to you, Jesus or this murderer Barabbas? They said, what? Give us Barabbas. We don't want the holy and just one. Peter said that Jesus was the prince of life there in verse 15. He said, you killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. That word prince, it, it means founder or originator. Do you understand what Peter is saying? He's saying, you killed the guy who created life. Or maybe the guy is the wrong term, but the God that created life. That's who Jesus was. He was literally the one in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 when it said, Let there be, he was the one speaking. John 1, 3 says all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. You know what the most amazing part to that was? Jesus created the very people that would crucify him. Isn't that just, you back up and say, wow. Listen, I'm, I'm human and, you know, you, you do things to me that I don't agree with or you persecute me or hurt me, I'm probably going to back up and steer clear of you, right? Maybe I shouldn't. I should love you anyway, right? See, that's what Jesus did for us. He loved us anyway. Even though all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, even though we're not worth loving, Jesus said, I love you. So much so, I'm willing 
to go to Calvary to pay your sin debt. And they killed the prince of life because they didn't want that kind of a savior. Oh, but God showed them, right? God showed them, and again, in verse 15, when they killed the prince of life, it says God raised them from the dead or raised him from the dead. Peter said, which we're witnesses. You crucified the Messiah, but God raised him. Listen, if you're going to make a, such a claim that Jesus is alive, you better have witnesses, right? The Bible says there were 500 witnesses apart from his disciples, his, his uh, uh, 12 apostles. They saw Jesus risen. John put it like this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. He said, that which was in the beginning, we have heard. Now understand, we're talking to people who have seen Jesus with their own eyes, touched Jesus with their own hands, heard Jesus with their own ears. Uh, again, John said, John 1.1, 1, 1, that which was from the beginning we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. See, Peter and John throughout this whole thing is just, they're saying, listen, Listen, these are the things Jesus came to do. He came to serve. He came to be God in the flesh. He came to reveal what God looks like. And that wasn't the Savior that you were willing to accept. You see, it's at this point I back up and I, I ask, what kind of Jesus do I want? Maybe I should ask, what kind of Jesus do we want today? I think most people want Jesus the healer. Lord, I'm sick. I've got this terrible disease. Please heal me. That's the Jesus we want. And it's a good Jesus. He can do that. Others want Jesus the provider. Those that will meet the needs and provide food, clothing, shelter, and take care of me when I'm financially in a bind that God comes to the rescue. Still others want Jesus the protector that shields us from harm. And Most people want Jesus just to be ready to act whenever we call. But is that who Jesus is? You see, Jesus is not in the business of filling wish lists. He was never intended to be viewed as Santa Claus. Jesus is God. And Jesus is in the life-transforming business. Okay? That's the point of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all, behold, all things have become new. You see, we're living in an age today that I think people have this view of Jesus of, okay, he's just whatever I want. And because I believe he exists, I'm saved no, that's not the truth. As a matter of fact, I think many churches, we get a bad reputation from those who claim to be saved, yet they live like the devil and those outside the church, they look and they say, well, if that's what it is to be a Christian, then I don't, I don't want it. You see, the Bible says you'll know them by their fruits. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Here's what I want you to get today. Jesus is not a fairy tale. He's not Santa Claus. <laughs> Jesus is God. And he's coming again. And so the question that you've got to ask today is, is, what does Jesus want from us? What does Jesus want from you, from me? Well, the first thing 
I want to point out to you is the amazing grace that is still present. Even though Jesus came to serve and he came to be God and, and he was all those things and people said, I don't want that. There was still mercy. Even today in people who have cursed God, who have said, I don't want anything to do with God. If that's what Christianity is, I don't want any part of it. There's still mercy. Look, look at what Peter said. He said, you did these things in ignorance. Verse 17. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance. Did what? They crucified Jesus. You see, Peter kind of changes his tone here a little bit. He's, he's saying... You killed Jesus. You killed Jesus. But I know, bless your heart, you did it out of ignorance because you didn't know any better. Kind of reminds us of what Jesus meant. Luke 23, verse 34. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, you remember his words, Father, forgive them. Read this with me. For they do not know what they do. Do you see the grace there? The mercy? And understand today, as, as we're all here, that, that we all have a sin problem. That none of us deserve heaven. But God gave His only Son, Jesus, so that you could have heaven, even though you are a sinner. Yes, you don't deserve it. But that's what love is in the sight of God. That's what compassion is. So what do you have to do? Well, it's very easy. Peter said repent and be converted. That, that word repent, it means to turn, change directions, turn away from. Okay? That word be converted literally means to turn to. So in our language it says turn away from and turn to. If you're going to turn away from something, you've got to turn to something else, right? Makes sense. This is the part I think a lot of people don't get again. They, they think they walk, walk down an aisle, I've done it. No, you turn away from what? Sin, self, whatever it is that gets in the way of God. And you turn to Jesus and Jesus alone. That's the way of salvation. That's what Peter is sharing, which is really amazing considering what these people did. These were the very people that crucified Jesus. And Peter's saying, you didn't know what you were doing. And even though you did all this stuff, God still loves you and offers salvation to you. <laughs> they kill Jesus and they're being invited to become a follower. Pretty amazing love, is it not? It says if you repent and be converted, the result of that is that your sins, verse 19, that your sins may be blotted out. Here's where it really gets interesting, okay? That word blot out means to erase. Very simple word. It's to erase a written record. And the way it was used in that day, it referred to short or temporary records that didn't need to last a long time. And they would write those down on pot, on pot shears, or, or, uh, which was just broken pieces of pottery, or wax tablets, right? And the ink would just sit on the top of that record of whatever it was. When they decided they didn't need that record anymore, they would take a damp cloth and just wipe that record away. They would reuse it, right? Something really interesting. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. We read of the great white throne judgments, which is the judgment for those who have rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. Okay? If you do not believe in Jesus, this is the judgment that that you have to look forward to. Revelation 20, 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now, 
want to break this down. Again, this is a great white throne judgment. If you're a believer, if you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, this is not your judgment. This is for the non-believer. Okay? If you're a believer, you're going to stand before the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, which is a whole different judgment, a whole different time. Okay? But John starts out in Revelation 20, 12. He says, I saw the greatest of men and the least of men. Small and great. Important, not important. You understand at this judgment there will be movie stars. There will be music stars. At this judgment there will be millionaires and billionaires. College professors, high school teachers, educators of all sorts. Oh, but it's not limited to that. There will be poor, uneducated, homeless even. But it doesn't stop there. The middle class who have just lived a life and, and just got through, fed their family and took care of business and went on. There will be every kind of person at this judgment. The one thing they will all have in common is that they have rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior. When they arrived there, it says the books were open. Wonderful. Uh, the Greek word for books, guess what it is? Biblia. Sound familiar? When it says the books were open, guess what books that are going to be opened? We have 66 books right here. 66 books that we know as the Word of God. In these 66 books is contained the standards of God, the expectations of God. Not only was, and, and so uh, you've guessed it at this point, the books that are open, I believe, are the word of God, the standard of God. Then there's another book open, the book of life. Now, this is not the Lamb's book of life. Okay, now checking to see if you're written in the Lamb's book of life. They already know that's not... That's not the case. This is the book of the living. Literally, it's what the Greek says. The book of the living. This is the book of your life. Now picture this. Okay? At this judgment, the books are going to be open. The standard, the word of God. And it's going to be laid out there. Then another book, which is the book of the living or the book of your life going to be laid out beside and guess what your works are going to be judged based upon the God's standard which is the word of God listen I love the word of God it is wonderful I love but I don't want to be judged according to the word of God and the reason I don't is because I, I need mercy you see I'm a sinner but if I were to reject Jesus Christ, what I would do is I would face God based on my own merit. And that book of the living or book of my life would be opened and, oh, there would be that lie. Oh, the word of God says lying is wrong. Guilty. But Jesus, I'm not nearly as big a liar as Brother Michael is. You know what God says? He's, this isn't about Brother Michael. You're not being judged for Brother Michael. You're being judged according to the standard of God. Let's go on. You're guilty. <laughs> okay. You're guilty of dishonesty. Well, Lord, I'm not as, guilt, I'm not as dishonest as, as... No. This is... Between you and God. How do you answer or respond to your dishonesty? Guilty. And we can go down the sins of... I put had other gods that I put before God. Sexual immorality, whatever you want to name. But what you're going to find is your life does not measure up against the standard of God. You need mercy. But if you 
to that judgment, the great white throne judgment, you see you've waited too late for mercy. That's what Peter is telling these people. Guys, there's good news. The good news is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. That for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God. It is a gift that God wants to give you. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's all grace. Romans 10.9 tells us the good news. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... Let me put that in our language. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the idea there is to make Jesus your Lord, the Lord of your life. You see, once again, it's more than just walking down an aisle or acknowledging the existence of Jesus. It is making Jesus the Lord of your life. But let's go on. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you've got to believe he's still alive. You see, apart from Jesus, you are your only hope. And you have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what I want you to get. I want you to get it from the standpoint this isn't the preacher shaking his finger at you. But this is a preacher who's, like everybody else, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you know why I'm going to heaven? Because of Jesus, not because of me. That's it. You see, I've called upon Jesus. I, I've, I've made him the Lord of my life. Is, does that mean I'm perfect? No, just follow me for 30 minutes and you'll have plenty of imperfections to talk about. But Jesus is my Lord. And I'm forgiven based upon what Jesus did. You see, we go on. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I love that statement because there's no room for doubt. If you've done it, it's done. Then he goes on, for with the heart one believes to righteousness with the mouth confession is made to salvation listen I, I, I'm not trying to pretend before you today and act like I'm somebody special because I am certainly not but here's what I know apart from Jesus Christ there is no hope but Jesus says come to me you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest Today, I would invite you, will you come to Jesus? I believe with all my heart that Jesus is alive. And I believe with all my heart that if you call upon him to make him the Lord of your life, he will save you. And then I believe with all my heart that if you close your eyes in death in this life, you'll open them in heaven in the next life. But you've got to know Jesus. You've got to choose Jesus. My friends, the decision is yours. But you understand this. Nobody knows what tomorrow holds. We don't know what's going to occur this afternoon. This may be the last opportunity you ever have. So whatever decision you make, you understand this. You may walk out of here facing eternity. Now, I'm not a fortune teller. I don't know what for anybody but I do know this the Bible says that we're not guaranteed tomorrow okay so if God's dealing with you will you choose Jesus today our father in heaven I thank you Lord for your word today I'm just reminded of the grace Lord that is present to you the love of mercy even though we're Lord, but Christ died for us. I pray for every lost person here today. I pray that today, Lord Jesus.
to convict and draw them to you. And that they would choose life through your Lord Jesus.